In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Perhaps the principal mystery of our faith, you're going to hear at the end of Mass, um, the hymn, the wonderful hymn by Father Faber. He writes lovely hymns filled with words like gushing and wast and wert and things like that. Anyway, he's got one on most ancient of the mysteries, he calls it in his hymn. So, um, yeah, it's not really a work of great artistic merit. The tune's quite nice and Fabian, so if you can join in, it's in the hymn book number 46. Most ancient of all mysteries. Um, the Easter cycle, I suppose, is over. Uh, that normally closed with Whit Sunday. Even the octave is a later addition, which is why you have that strange anomaly of fast and abstinence days falling during Whit Week, which, as a prolongation of a feast, should have nothing of the kind. But there you are. Now, that's the liturgical context of today's feast. I don't know, this is perhaps a little bit unfair. Is this a bit unfair for you people at the Second Mass? Probably a little bit. But there's not much, not much of a liturgical spirit in Scotland. And obviously there are historical reasons for that. And, you know, it's not your fault. It's just that's how it has been hitherto. Um, it might even be a general thing insofar as our secular lifestyle as a whole, which is five days work or school for your kids, uh, and then two family days they've become now, haven't they? Family days. I still remember, I'm old, I was born last century. I still remember when you worked on Saturday morning and the shops shut on Saturday afternoon. Well, that's, yeah, sign of age. Uh, but now, over the, the past, how old am I, 35? So over the last 30 years, say, those have, um, those, that has, there's been an evolution. And now you've got the five work days and the two family days. And if you've got that in the secular mindset, then going to Mass on a Sunday does seem a bit sort of an inconvenience, really, that you've got to fit in. Catholics know you've got to go and hear Mass on a Sunday. But it's sort of, can you imagine coming to the Mass at 11 when there's a nice, quick, early one which you could go to regularly as your sanctification of the Lord's Sabbath? Every week you could do that. Just imagine. And then you've got the whole day for family things instead of Mass getting in the way. But I would remind you, of course, not that you need reminding because you come to the 11 o'clock one, but I would remind you that actually the only reason we have Sunday off is because of Mass. And that's an historical thing which even the Presbyterians kept in the Church of Scotland uh, when they took over and robbed the of our churches in 1560. So that's gone on through society um, for centuries. But that's the actual reason why. It's not a family day. It wasn't instituted as a family day. It was instituted as a, a day when you could go to church. So... And I think the, the holy days of obligation, particularly these ones that fall during the week, Corpus Christi Ascension always fall during the week because they're on a Thursday. This week, this year, um, St. Peter and Paul uh, is on a Wednesday, which is a holy day of obligation. Uh, still, the bishops have, have sort of abandoned the idea that you can possibly go. You used to... Um, um, well, this is before 1560. I mean, people used to have to work six days and then the seventh day was the Lord's Day. Uh, and therefore, if there was a holy day during the week, a big feast like All Saints or St. Peter and Paul, um, then they would be um, uh, very keen to get out of the daily drudgery and have a bit of a day off. People didn't go away on holidays either, like they do now. So the holy day thing was quite important. Um, well, there you are. We can't expect the state <laughs> to understand why we would want to celebrate the body of Christ. That's what it means, Corpus Christi. The body of Christ. Why would we want to celebrate that, they think? Or in a Protestant country, of course, why on earth would we want to celebrate the feast of the pillars of the Roman Church? 
St. Peter and St. Paul. But that's, that's just the state. So that's sort of like a background thing which mitigates against having a, <laughs> a liturgical spirit. But it's no good moaning about it. I'm always telling you people, it's no good moaning. Moaning doesn't achieve anything. So stop it. Uh, but I must remind you, that if the society is here in Edinburgh and uh, Glasgow in Scotland, the reason why we're here is to restore all things in Christ. That's why we're here. That's the, the motto of St. Pius X, the Pope. And it's sort of our motto as well. We are here in Scotland to restore all things in Christ because that's the only way any of us have of getting to heaven. I mean, you can... Some of the older ones might be able to remember. Uh, this is after the Second World War. Uh, there was what I think people look back on as something like a golden age in the history of the Catholic Church in Scotland. Uh, you, you'd come, I mean, a big city centre like Edinburgh would have lots of churches, and outside the churches there'd be notice boards, uh, and for Sunday Masses you'd have them starting at seven, more or less, on the hour. Um, and, and several of them on a Sunday. And then Holy Days of Obligation, you'd have the dinner hour slot. So people could sneak in during their dinner hour, hear Mass on a Holy Day, and then go back to work. Um, I'm not old enough to remember that, but I have read about it uh, in books, and I've heard about it on wistful podcasts. Indeed, I get the impression that that is the aim of, <laughs> what can I call them, the competition, let's call them the competition, the LMS, or Una Voce Scotland, as we call them up here. They, 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 I get the impression that they would like us to sort of just wipe away the last 70 years of history and pretend that we're living in, in the 1950s again and, and restore everything, not in Christ, but restore it to how it was in the 1950s. But where did that lead? What happened at the end of the 1950s? And in the 1960s in particular, after several years of that, well, what happened, of course, uh, is despite all the nostalgia colouring your memories, uh, that we had the, the council. <laughs> and then, because there wasn't a liturgical spirit, and, and due to all sorts of other things linked to that, people abandon the faith. Um, I mean, obviously, probably in the 70s, most Catholics, I would say, would continue to obediently go to their low mass on a Sunday until the whole vulgarity and tawdriness of the thing uh, got too much. And then either they'd give up going altogether or they'd end up coming to us. Because if it's a question of ticking boxes, the essence, what is the substance of the Catholic faith? Ticking boxes. Oh, Sunday Mass, tick. But it was at seven o'clock, you were half asleep, uh, and it was over in 50 minutes. So you could get the next lot in for eight. Yeah, yeah but I ticked the box. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Hmm. You know, going to the church building on a, when Mass happens to be on, uh, and even if it's on a holy day, <laughs> you've got to tick the holy day box. Oh, there's a, a lunchtime Mass, and the best part is it's done and dusted in 40 minutes. Great. That's perfect. And then you can come in, tick the box, and then go... So if that was the spirit that, that motivated people, if that's what they wanted, something quick and convenient principally, then when something even quicker, the new mass is an awful aberration. Uh, it's really quick and it's in English. 
or it's in Polish. You can understand everything that's been going on. And I think that in the 50s, there was this idea, that, and this obviously led to it, this was outside your control, but there was this idea amongst the senior clergy, the, the Pope and, and bishops and people, who were saying, well, uh, liturgical spirit is, is, is important. They've got to have a liturgical spirit and not just private devotions. Well, they're not opposed. They're not opposed. But it is true that the people should have a liturgical spirit. They should have uh, a liturgical spirit. And so Pius XII thought, back in 1947, I think it is, uh, when he wrote Media Today, oh, well, let's put that problem to rest. What they need to do is keep the private devotions, that's good to have at Mass, but have a liturgical spirit as well. Um, <laughs> but once he was dead, then we got the council. And, and the council replaced a mystery. This is a mystery. Poorly explained. And what can you explain in ten minutes? People earnestly say, I'm sure they're good faithful. And some of them do it with a bit of a joke. Perhaps they think, oh, this will this all sort of sweeten the pill. They tell me earnestly that you can't talk for more than 10 minutes. People are not going to put up. It's an imposition. Particularly on holy days of obligation, they want to get back home or back to work if it was at 12.30. We don't want long sermons instructing us in the faith and telling us and explaining the mysteries of God, the mysteries of the body of Christ. What happens if you don't explain the mysteries of the body of Christ for 60 years, which is what we've got? 63% of people who go to Mass. People who go to Mass, which is not very many. 63% believe in the real presence, which is almost half don't, and they still go to Mass. Because it was never explained. It's not been explained. You've got to take time, whether it's the body of Christ or whether it's the Blessed Trinity or, or whatever the mystery is. Some of these parables that our Lord tells us throughout the churches, they need to be explained so people can apply it to their life now. What does it mean now? It's important to know that. So they replaced, <laughs> they replaced the mystery with something much more readily accessible. And the people, to a large extent, grabbed it with both hands. And then if you add to that the abolishment of uh, fasting and abstinence, and then the introduction of that strange liturgical phenomenon, the Saturday evening Mass. Make it even more convenient. You can slot it in at the end of a Saturday and then the Sunday, far from being the day dedicated to the Lord and the worship of God, no, that's, that is a family day. You can do what you like on that day. So they got rid of fasting and abstinence. They got rid of uh, the Sunday obligation practically because many people do just go to the Saturday evening thing and go. You know the thing. As Joe Biden says, you know the thing. But what's the thing? that you know. Well, it's certainly not an expression of the Catholic faith anymore. That is absolutely clear. And where is it led? <laughs> where is it led in Catholic countries? Let's take, oh, Ireland's a nice example, and that's just across the sea. Where is it led? It's led to same-sex marriage, contraception, divorce, and now even, this is quite recently, abortion. Scotland's no better. So, at the risk of trying the patience of some of our faithful, I'm going to explain the liturgical significance of today's feast. And I'm going to take me time as well to do it properly. I mean, in a way it's a bit different because this is not it is a holy day of obligation in the sense that it's on a Sunday, it's not during the week. This is on a Sunday. And it's not part of the Easter cycle, I mentioned that. Um, and for many years, actually, I think I was explaining this last year, that there wasn't a special Mass dedicated to the Trinity um, on the Sunday after Whitsun. 
It was just the first Sunday after Whitson. That Mass we only say during the week now. Um, in the oldest sacramentary, or one of the oldest sacramentaries that we have, the Gregorium, it does have a votive Mass of the Blessed Trinity, which uses the preface that we're going to sing today. It's the same, exactly the same. Um, but it wasn't till 10th century when the office of this day was drawn up in the Low Countries and not until much later when this Mass was finally accepted for the Universal Church by Rome. I think I was saying last year it was John the Twelfth. That name sticks in my head. John the Twelfth finally allowed a Mass dedicated particularly to the Blessed Trinity. And why was there such opposition? Because the popes and the bishops, and indeed I imagine most of the faithful, realised, with the liturgical spirit that they had, that all Masses are dedicated to the Blessed Trinity. You don't need a special Mass just for the Blessed Trinity. Look at any Mass. It is offered to God. Sushipe Sancta Trinitas, we say. At every Mass, receive Most Holy Trinity. Um, so that's probably why. And the way that the Church teaches us at every Mass, and in a particular way in this feast, I have to say, it's not some abstract way. And people will think, well, it's a, it's a mystery. You need to explain it in philosophical terms. You need to have precision and uh, careful explanation. <laughs> it's a mystery. You can't understand it. You cannot understand the mystery. So the way that the liturgy teaches us is not in that abstract way, but rather as an application of the mystery to our supernatural life. And this feast of the Trinity is particularly, I would say, a feast of thanksgiving to the Blessed Trinity for all the graces of our redemption and our sanctification. And you can see this in the introit, which we had sung for us, uh, at the um, offertory, which is coming up, and then a communion verse. <laughs> can you see why this is important? I tell you these things, and I'm sure you do listen to it, I'm sure you've got a missile uh, and are following. What, what are these the choir singing? Is it just to thwart our getting out of church a little bit earlier by going on singing? No! These texts that they're singing, which I read at the altar very quietly, are the food for your soul. I mean, it is true that you can attend Mass without opening a book, but it, I think it's really a useful way of following. What is the Church teaching me today by looking at these texts and understanding what is being sung to us, particularly during Mass? And then, of course, you've got the Epistle, which has this doxology of praise, uh, which I think is, if it's not the same one, it's certainly very similar to the one that comes at the end of the canon. Um, and then the Gospel has the most explicit scriptural reference to the Trinity in the baptismal formula, which was used right from the very beginning of the Church. Sometimes in Scripture it's called the baptism of Christ, but that refers to its author, not to the form that you use. Um, and <laughs> when I was looking it up, you know I do these things. It's, it's a hobby horse, really. But in Polish we say, Vimio ojca i syna i ducha świętego. Yeah. In English, we translate the Greek much more closely. I mean, they can't do it in Polish <laughs> because they don't have definite articles, so you can't do it but we say in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And in Greek, that's very, very important because uh, if you have the definite article be before each of the nouns, then the divinity, the Godhead, is predicated of all three persons, which you wouldn't get if the definite article was missed out. So it's re that's really, really significant that it happens in the Greek. Um, so, there you are. As I said at the beginning, uh, the Trinity is the principal mystery of our faith, and it's one that's contained in all the 
liturgical prayers of the church and that's why it's that's what's the most important lesson i think to take away from this because it's not just for today obviously you can follow today uh, scrupulously in your missiles or your little slip of paper that gets put in the red book that's fine but it's for every mass that you go to that you see this you can see what's going on and then if ever we were to come along and say right we're not having this anymore we're going to do something that's much more accessible to you you would say no no father we're not accepting that sorry and that would be it because you're too well instructed you wouldn't be bamboozled simply by the nebulous concept of authority um, because it's important at all masses to have this understanding so that you have a true devotion. What is devotion? True devotion consists in the handing over of man to God, the giving of himself to God. And that's why devotion, particularly to the Blessed Trinity, is necessary, <laughs> because... Um, we are baptised in the name of the Blessed Trinity and our souls and indeed our whole being are consecrated to the Trinity at the beginning of our life. <laughs> and it doesn't stop there because our sins are forgiven in the name of the Trinity. Uh, married love is sanctified in the name of the Trinity. And even at the end of life, I mean, this is something I've seen over the last month uh, with Ruth Raquillen and Evelyn Pelosi, God rest them, uh, that you say, go forth, O Christian soul, out of this world in the name of the Father who created thee, in the name of the Son who redeemed thee, and in the name of the Holy Ghost who sanctified thee. So that's the whole life of the Catholic is bound up in this mystery. And it's really important. Now, where does that leave us then? <laughs> Here in Edinburgh in 2022. Is that the end of all the difficulties? No more difficulties then. Once we've grasped that, we're high and dry. Well, uh, this week I was reading a book by Peter Anson. And it was called roving recluse and he lived in harbour head and you know i should have looked this up on google maps i can't remember if it's in aberdeenshire or if it's in banffshire i've got an idea it's aberdeen aberdeenshire but i can't swear to that you can look it up on google maps when you get home um, but he lived up there um after the war i think he wrote in 1947 this book so it's this golden age that I was talking about. How did the golden age look in a rural Aberdeenshire at that time? Well, <laughs> not very promising. This is after 100 years of Catholic emancipation, slightly more. 120 years after Catholic emancipation, 1829. What, was, what did it look like after 120 years of freedom? Well, there were no Holy Week ceremonies. There were no processions. Nothing to publicly proclaim. It was, it was not against the law anymore. It was not against the law. It didn't matter. You could go out for a Corpus Christi procession and, um, or for a Candlemas procession, or for a Palm Sunday procession. You could still do these things. You could walk in front of the coffin from someone's house to the church. You could do that. It was allowed, as long as you told the police beforehand. Uh, then they would allow it only. And I'm sure the Presbyterians did that. Or well, certainly the, the Piskies did. Uh, they would dress up in all their stuff and walk through the street. The Catholics never did that. And the reason that he gives is, or at least the, this is the impression that he got. There's that famous text of St. Paul. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And that's the sort of thing that a Catholic might put on his tombstone, because he's dead. So it's, he's run his course now. He's fought the good fight. He's now in his grave. But he said that he gets the impression that that's their, their life now as Catholics. 
But 300 years of persecution is over. It's gone. There's no more persecution. Um, so they have run the race and they've fought the fight. And now they can sit back and see what happens. <laughs> no. No. Um, if they did very little other than, say, a low mass on a Sunday, then that, that's not living the Catholic faith. I mean, it is true. You talk about Corpus Christi possessions or Palm Sunday possessions. At the restoration of the hierarchy, which is, what, 1878? Um, St Andrews was restored as the primatial see of the Scottish diocese, and there were 12 Catholics in St Andrews in 1878, 12. And in Harbour Head, which is in the 1940s, there was half that. I mean, here in the East, we didn't get that huge influx, um, which they got in the west of the country, uh, of Irish, which is, um, with the emancipation in 1829, they came over in the potato famines and, and, and started filling up the western parishes uh, and giving new life and new blood to those places. We didn't really get it over here in the east, particularly not so far north. So, uh, they thought it was over. They think it's over. Well, it isn't yet. What's the secular government? I'm looking at the secular government. Secular government has passed the uh, Emancipation Act. Does the secular government behave in a um, keen and supportive role of the, of the Catholic Church? We saw this over the last two years. I had the coppers <laughs> knocking on the door, trying to get in when I was behind locked doors saying mass for you people. Because the government had decided, I mean, encouraged by the bishops, we have to say, encouraged by the bishops, uh, that you couldn't go to Mass in case you caught the lurgy or spread it to other people. So we were raided at least twice, and perhaps it's tipped more than that. And then even when we were allowed to open, we were allowed to open, we couldn't have more than 50 people in. <laughs> we had spies taking photographs and sending them off to the council that were having far more than that. And they were putting everyone in danger. <laughs> Incredible. So if you think it's over with the secular governments, you're wrong. Secular governments are no friends of the Catholic Church, particularly if we stand up for some it. And what about the ecclesiastical authorities? <laughs> well, as I say... They were behind shutting the churches, weren't they? They shut the churches before the state did. Uh, the Sunday, Laetare Sunday, what was it? Yeah, Laetare Sunday, the Sunday after St. Joseph that year. The bishops shut the churches. The state only did it the next week. The bishops. So the ecclesiastical authorities have been persecuting the practice of the Catholic faith for 60 years. You want to go to a nice, a nice Tridentine Mass? You can't. It's forbidden, they would say. You're excommunicated. You're schismatic. And if you go, merely out of curiosity, you will catch it. It's like the lurgy. That's how catching excommunication is. So they were trying to terrify people in not coming here. Of course, <laughs> curiously enough, events worked together. It was because they shut the rest of the churches, this was the only one open. So people did sort of come trickling in and they've stayed because they realise what they're getting. So civil authorities, ecclesiastical authorities are against the practice of the Catholic faith. So the fight is not over. Does that mean it is an obstacle because we have a struggle to live our Catholic faith or even an excuse for not doing very much. <laughs> no, no. It's, it's a challenge, isn't it? I would like to present it to you today as a challenge. Positive opposition is infinitely easier to endure than negative indifference, which is the atmosphere we're living in today.
No one cares. But in a negative way. No one cares, and you're not allowed to care. So, um, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to further. It's a challenge to live the life of the Blessed Trinity from day to day and to truly offer yourselves to God. Today, the Church exhorts us all that we should remember that we've been born again in God. We have been consecrated to the Trinity. So let us renew our fervour on this day and let our praises ring out to God, the one God, the triune God, Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Amen.